Well, hi, everybody. It's really an honor to be invited to be part of this series. I think it's a wonderful idea. And I was delighted when Jared invited me to be part of this. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon uh, really draws on all of my background and my experience as a climate scientist. I'm a climatologist. I qualified in South Africa and have worked in the UK, South Africa, and here in Australia. Uh, in climate science, particularly in climate variability, and then in the last 10 to 15 years or so, increasingly in climate change. My interests are in the science, particularly, uh, and the intersection between variation of climate and climate change, and then merging into impacts of climate change and adaptation, uh, which I see as being one of the key challenges facing human societies, actually, as we go forward into the next decades and beyond. So I'm going to talk a little bit this afternoon about what we know about climate change. The first thing, of course, which uh, we now take for granted very much is to realize that our planet, Earth, is a closed system. We first saw it from outside in the 1960s uh, when we first left the planetary system uh, as the space uh, exploration began, and that brought home to us just how very closed the system is. And in fact, it's only energy, really, that leaves and enters the system. And it's the energy of the sun that really drives the processes that are happening uh, within the planetary system, and particularly those associated with our climate. So when we talk about climate change, what we're really talking about is alterations in the energy balance of our system, the balance between incoming shortwave solar energy and longwave or heat energy that leaves the system uh, and goes back out to space. And changes in that balance can make a very big difference to the temperatures that we experience here at the Earth's surface. And that is all moderated by the atmosphere and by the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere. So what I'm going to talk about a bit first is our observations. What have we been measuring that is going on uh, with our climate system? And what are some of the things that we know beyond doubt are actually happening? The uh, first thing that I'll show you with this is an animation of global temperatures. Now, we've been measuring temperatures with modern instrumentation, actually going back to the 1600s. Uh, there's a very long record of temperature from central England near Cambridge, uh, which goes back to the 1700s. Uh, and that's one of our longest continuous records that we have. But we've been measuring with something like modern thermometers for several centuries. And we have a long record around the world of temperature uh, that goes back into the 1800s. So from about the 1850s or so, uh, we have a good temperature record that we can use to look at global temperatures. The animation I'm going to show you doesn't show the actual temperatures. It shows what we call the anomalies or the deviations of temperature from month to month from an average period. The average period that's used for this is 1961 to 1990. It's a 30-year period in the late 20th century, which is a standard period against which to measure the variations of temperature. In the animation, when you see an area in blue, it means that the temperatures were below the long-term average, and when it's yellow or orange, it's above the long-term average. So these are monthly values of temperature expressed as these deviations from the long-term average, and it goes forward in time. The date shows in the bottom of the screen. Uh, the animation starts in 1884. It goes fairly quickly, so one needs to pay attention. So we're starting in the late 19th century, and what you'll notice is that most of the globe is cooler in this early period than the late 20th century average, but there are areas which show up in yellow which move around and uh, which demonstrate that there were some places that were a little warmer. As we get into the 1960s and then into the 1970s, the areas shaded in yellow and then increasingly in orange as we get to the 1990s and the 2000s start to dominate. So what we're seeing there is variability, spatial variation, and variation in time of the temperatures, but a very clear indication that the world was cooler and that it has warmed, and it's warmed particularly rapidly since about the 1970s, mid-1970s, and into the 20-teens, where we now are. You'll also notice, looking at this map, which is for 2011, that some of the largest positive temperature anomalies, the, warm, the greatest rates of warming, are occurring in the high-latitude northern hemisphere. And I'm going to be coming back to that. It's starting off at a low base, of course. It's rather cold up there. But we're seeing the most rapid rates of warming up there in the northern hemisphere and also over the continental areas and increasingly over the ocean areas as well. There's a couple of other things to notice here. The Antarctic Peninsula, 
is showing some very rapid rates of warming as well. So we're getting both southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere high latitude warming. And here in 2011, we can see that it's cooler over the eastern Pacific Ocean, and that's tied in with the El Nino southern oscillation. We had a big La Nina event which lasted through from 2010 through to 2012, early 2012, and that put a cold signature onto that part of the global system, which had an effect actually on global average temperatures. Okay, so we have spatial variation, variation in time, but the underlying signature that we're seeing in the temperatures, and there is no doubt about this, this is clearly measured and observed, is that temperatures have been increasing. We've seen them increasing from about 0.4 of a degree below the current long-term average, the 1961 to 90 period, from about 1900 through to 1940 or so. At that point, temperatures fell a little and then leveled. And then from the mid-1970s, temperatures have been increasing. The overall trend, if one looks at the period from, in fact, 1850 through to the present, is of this increase in temperature. You'll notice that there are some error bars on here showing that our confidence in these measures of temperature has increased as these error bars have got smaller as we come closer to the present. And that is, of course, because we now have truly global measurements from satellites as well as ground-based observations, whereas in the early part of this record, we were relying over the oceans for measurements from ships, for instance. All of this data has been very carefully worked through, uh, corrected, so that we're able to treat it as a continuous data series, correcting for differences in types of measurement. So we have a very clear record of an overall increase of temperature. Now, the overall amount of increase that we've seen so far is about 0.8 of one degree, um, since the beginning of the 20th century, well, in fact, since the mid-19th century, we've seen just under one degree of global warming. So when we think about the impacts of the temperature rise that we've seen so far, we have to realise that thus far, that's the amount of warming, and I'd like you to bear that in mind as I go on in a little while to talk about impacts. Now, how unusual is what we're currently seeing? A very interesting piece of work has just been published earlier this month in the journal Science, uh, which is a very prestigious um, multidisciplinary scientific journal. And this work by Mark Cottetel, a group of climatologists, has reconstructed a temperature record backwards in time for 11,000 years. Now, we've got various reconstructions of temperature records back in time, and I'm going to show you a much longer one in a little while. But this one looks in great detail at what the temperatures have been like over this 11,000-year period. Now, of course, when we go back beyond uh, about 1800, we don't have any measurements with thermometers, and what we use are proxy measures of temperature. This one is based on a combination of record from tree rings, dendroclimatology, dendrochronology, records from pollen in bogs and sediments, uh, and other forms of proxy data. What it's able to show us is that when we go back in time 11,000 years, 11,000 years ago it was cooler, we were coming out of the last glaciation at that point, the conditions then warmed uh, to about 0.4 degrees above the 1961 to 1990 average, which defines the zero line, leveled off through this warm period in the geological period known as the Holocene. It's called the Holocene Climatic Optimum, and then cooled again down into the Little Ice Age, this cool period here, uh, in the immediately pre-modern period, about oh, 1,500 or so, we had this Little Ice Age period. Temperatures then started to rise a bit and then rose very, very rapidly in the recent period. What's very clear from this is that the temperature increase that we've seen in the last 150 years or so has reversed a, an overall trend that took 5,000 years of cooling to get down to that base has been reversed in 150 years. We've seen a rate of change of temperature that is unprecedented in a record of this time scale. And in fact, this rate of change of temperature is unprecedented in the last million years of record that we have. So it is a very unusual time that we're currently living in. Okay, so when we think about Australia, let's bring it closer to home. What does this all mean for us? Well, this is a map from Bureau of Meteorology data of temperature, and it shows the highest maximum temperatures in the week ending the 15th of January 2013. Now, I'm sure that since it's only March 2013, many people will remember what 
summer of January was like. It was an extremely hot period in which a great many temperature records were broken in Australia. So we're seeing here temperatures in the brown colours and in the dark red that are over 40 degrees. So a very large part of the Australian continent was experiencing temperatures at that time well above 40 degrees. This is unusual, of course. More extremes is a tendency, a trend, that we are currently dealing with. The Climate Commission, the government-appointed group of experts who has been advising the government on climate-related issues for the last uh, couple of years now, has just put out a report that appeared just a couple of weeks ago called The Angry Summer. And this report highlights what has just occurred in the summer of 2012-13 highlighting, for example, the number of temperature records broken in January with temperatures, uh, I'll just point a few out here, 48.8 degrees at Thangaminda, 47.9 at Tibuburra, uh, 46.3 at Lee Creek, uh, 47.2 up there, and so on. So very many temperature records being broken uh, by a great deal, not simply by 0.1 or 0.2 of a degree, but by large amounts. At the same time, we had uh, these hottest daily maximum temperatures being recorded. We were also recording hottest monthly average maximum and warmest January nights. All of these extremes are an indication of a climate system that is struggling to cope, if you like, with the very big disturbance that is going on with global warming uh, and greenhouse gas induced climate change. And I'll be coming to more of that in just a minute. There is an underlying trend, as I've already shown you from the global data, of increasing temperatures. And for Australia, this is playing out differently across the country. So what we see here are rates of change, trends in temperature in degrees per decade from 1970 to 2012. So we've got just over 40 years of data here expressed as degrees per decade. And when we look at what this means, it's showing us that for large parts of eastern and central Australia, we've had rates of temperature increase of between 0.2 and 0.3 degrees per decade. When you take that out over 40 years, it means that we've had temperature increases of somewhere around 0.8 to 1.2 degrees over this entire period. That's all within our lifetimes and our experience. It's happening sort of under the radar in a way because it's happening gradually. So we're not aware in our daily lives, necessarily, of the way that temperatures have been increasing. You'll also notice that it's got a little cooler up in the northwest, and that's associated with increased cloud cover and increased rainfall over this period of time, largely because we've been getting more intense tropical cyclones in that region uh, and some more active monsoon behavior, which is typical of what's happening throughout the global tropics. As the world is warming, we're getting more cloud cover, more rainfall in the tropics. Let's bring it really close to home. For Canberra, this is what we see in terms of heat waves. The underlying trend of temperature is extremely important and it's having an impact on us as humans and on the global system, on all of life. But what is really showing impact is the extremes, the extreme events in droughts and floods and in temperatures in terms of heat waves. This is some work that I'm currently doing with a colleague and what we've been looking at is the Canberra record in great detail. It's a very high quality record based on Bureau of Meteorology data. And what it shows, if you divide the period when, since the uh, temperature record started in 1939 into two, breaking it in the mid-1970s, there's many measures of heat. So we use 36.5 degrees as the definition of an extremely hot day as a maximum temperature. So the total number of days in this entire period uh, that had exceeded that temperature 70 of them occurred in the early part of the record and 138 in the later part of the record coming up to the present. That's a 97% increase. That's highly significant. The number of days of that magnitude of temperature occurring during heatwave events, when we have three days in a row exceeding that value, 51 to 115, 125% increase. The total number of heatwave events days above 36.5, three days in a row or more, 42 to 81, almost doubled. And the number of heatwave events extending over more than five days, 18 to 27, a 50% increase. All of this is demonstrating that we're getting a highly significant increase in the heat wave, extremely hot conditions. And of course, that has an effect on human health as well as on the environment.
Now, what I want to show you is that this is not unique to Australia or to Canberra. We're seeing similar things happening right across the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, so what we're seeing here is the distribution of temperatures right across the Northern Hemisphere uh, annually. The grey in the middle shows that most of the time the temperatures are around the average. Where it's blue, it's showing that there's a frequency, uh, a declining frequency of days or months or whatever that are colder than the average. And there's a relatively small number of events that are warmer than the average in the red. So this is what's called the normal distribution. Most of the time things are close to average. What we see in this animation, and I'll just let it play again, is that while the distribution in the 1950s was close to this average condition, as we move through the 1970s into the 80s and beyond, the distribution is shifting towards the right. This is showing us that we're getting more and more high temperature events, days, months, etc., and fewer of the cold events. But at the same time as the whole curve is shifting to the right, demonstrating the increase in temperature overall, we're also seeing that it's flattening the curve is actually getting lower. What that means is that we're getting fewer events around the peak, fewer of the days or months or whatever are around the average, and more and more are being pushed out towards the extremes. So not only are we getting a shift towards warmer temperatures, we're also seeing a more variable climate in terms of temperatures. We're getting increased variability, more extremes of both the cold variety and of the warm variety. And this, I think, can cause some confusion for people because when we do get a really severe cold event, such as a blizzard in China or a major snowfall event in Europe, that sort of thing which has been happening in recent years, many people feel, well, this can't possibly be associated with global warming. It should all be about hot weather events. But because of this increase in variability, as our complex global system is attempting to respond to climate change and to adjust itself, we're seeing an increase in vari variance or variability in the system as well. So I think this is a very good demonstration, just very recently published at the end of last year, uh, that demonstrates this uh, beyond any doubt. And what is particularly interesting about that, get back on track here, is that the uh, nature of this change, the shift towards the right, the shift towards warmer conditions, as well as the flattening of the top of the curve and the increase in variability is something that had been predicted would happen uh, and was reflected in the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change reports way back in the early 2000s, 2001. This graph was in the IPCC reports showing that what we expected to happen uh, is an increase in the mean, a shift towards the right, and the uh, flattening of the curve and the pushing out of uh, the events towards the extremes. And in fact, the combination of the two is exactly what we now have the evidence for in this very recent publication. So what climate scientists have been saying for more than a decade is what we expect is in fact what we are finding. So that's in terms of temperature. Now, incontrovertible that we've got temperature increasing and an increase in variability. This is what we observe happening and we know that it's very unusual even on long time scales such as tens of thousands of years. What are the impacts of this that we currently see occurring? I'm going to focus on just one. There are so many that one can talk about. We're seeing impact in the biosphere, in changes in the range of plant and animal species. We're seeing it in the water cycle, in changes in rainfall. We're seeing it in sea level. Sea level is rising. There are so many. What I've chosen to focus on is the area of the world where we're seeing the fastest rates of temperature increase in the Arctic. And I'm going to look at the Arctic sea ice in the summer. What is being measured here is the area of the Arctic Ocean that is covered by, or partially covered by ice in the summer, which is the time when it reaches its minimum extent. And that time is the middle of September. So what we're looking at here is a comparison between 2000 and, oh, sorry, excuse me, back, 2007 on the left, which is the previous sea ice minimum, uh, that was reached on the 16th of September 2007 when the sea ice covered 4.17 million square kilometers of the Arctic Ocean, that's the white here, and that was considerably less than the average sea ice extent which is shown by this line here 
from the late 20th century, 1979 to 2000, uh, that proportion of the Arctic Ocean would have been covered by ice in the summer. So it had really receded substantially in 2007. In 2012, we had the dubious distinction as a planet of reaching a new world record, and that new world record is a sea ice extent of 3.6 million square kilometers of the Arctic Ocean covered by ice. And you can see that extent as it was uh, in August, uh, before the minimum was reached, in fact, here shaded in white. Now, why is this a concern? Well, it's a concern for many reasons, environmentally for the Arctic, it's a very serious issue. And for the planet as a whole, it's a serious issue because the Arctic, as all parts of the world, is part of a global system. When we expose ocean areas which were previously covered by ice, what we're effectively doing is exposing a darker colored surface than was previously there. The ice is light colored, it reflects incoming sunlight and stays cool. The ocean is a darker surface, it absorbs more uh, solar energy and therefore warms up. So the more ocean surface we expose at the expense of the ice, the darker that area becomes in color and the more it will tend to absorb energy and therefore to warm. And that's part of the global energy balance. And therefore that what we call the ice albedo feedback, the positive feedback that is going on up there is of uh, very great concern. Melting the sea ice doesn't raise sea level because the ice is floating in the ocean and it displaces its volume. But what the sea ice does in addition to uh, changing the energy balance is it acts as a barrier to ice on Greenland and around Canada, for example, and the northern parts of Eurasia, and keeps some of that land ice on the continental land areas. When that land ice is no longer buffered and held in by that barrier, it will flow out into the ocean more rapidly, which is exactly what's happening in Greenland, for instance. And that land ice going into the ocean and melting does, in fact, add to sea level rise. So, that's what's been happening. Now, I just want to focus in on one little story, which I think is fascinating and is real, new science that has just been published right at the end of last year. This is uh, Dr. Marcel Nicolaus. He's a sea ice physicist at the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research in Bremerhaven in Germany. And he's been working on sea ice for a number of years in the Arctic, looking at what is going on up there in detail. I won't go into it in enormous detail, but just to highlight for you just some of the detailed sort of scientific work that is going into our understanding of climate change and global warming and its impacts. They mounted an, an expedition into the Arctic in 2011 uh, in which they undertook a number of very detailed measurements in the summer season of what was going on with that sea ice. And what their research has shown is that far from simply having ice floating on the, on the surface of sorry, ice floating on the surface of the ocean, um, simply uh, then melting, the ice that remains has meltwater pools on its surface. And those meltwater pools turn out to be very important. So you can see the expedition uh, set up here with all of their scientific equipment. In measuring what's going on in these meltwater pools, and in the background there, uh, one sees the Polarstern, which is the German research vessel, an icebreaker that goes to both the Arctic and the Antarctic for research. Uh, in analyzing and in evaluating what is going on with these surf surface meltwater pools, what they discovered is that the surface is only part of the story, but in fact that the ice is uh, melting from below as well as at the surface. And they were able to identify exactly what's going on underneath the ice by using a remote operated vehicle named the Alfred. They're seen here deploying this uh, into the ocean next to the ice. And by looking at the information that they're able to derive from this, what they're finding is that there is increased light transmission below the ice. So this is a map of the amount of light that's being penetrating down through the ice. In the areas where we have these surface meltwater pools, the light is being transmitted down through the ice much more effectively than it is in areas of thicker ice where we don't have the surface meltwater. And that means that there is more energy in the water, even below the surface of the ice, which is then adding to the melting of the ice and to the overall warming of that region. So what's happening in the Arctic is that we're seeing thinning of the ice. Uh, this is not about what you would have had in about 1980, with about 62% of incoming solar energy being reflected and about 34% uh, percent, um, 
being absorbed at the surface and 4% being transmitted, whereas by the 2010s, we're seeing only 37% being reflected and 11%, an order of magnitude increase in the amount of energy that is actually being transmitted down through the ice. So it's not only the ice albedo feedback with the dark ice, uh, dark water relative to the light ice, but even this, what's happening at the surface of the ice is encouraging warming in this positive feedback mechanism in the Arctic. So the ice is getting thinner. The ice is getting thinner, and it's also transmitting more light through it so that the ocean beneath the ice is warming as well as the ocean adjacent to the ice. So it's an accelerating process that's happening in the Arctic. So that's just a little snapshot of one piece of scientific work uh, which demonstrates the sort of level of detail and insight that is going into our understanding of climate change. Now, what about the causes of climate change? Well, of course, there is natural climate variability and there is natural climate change, and there always has been and there always will be. There are natural drivers of change in climate which include things like changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit, changes in the tilt of the Earth's axis over timescales of tens to hundreds of thousands of years, and these are very important. There's also changes in the output of energy of the sun, which changes the amount of energy reaching the Earth's surface, and that too leads to natural climate variation and change. But in addition to that, there is, of course, the role of humans. And the role of humans is now beyond a doubt in assisting in the driving of climate change. What is behind this is uh, really in simple terms, the greenhouse gases. Uh, everyone's heard of those. Carbon dioxide is one of the primary greenhouse gases. There are others, such as methane and nitrous oxide, that are influenced by human activities. Now, with carbon dioxide, this molecule, as well as other greenhouse gas molecules, are important because they are what is known as radiatively active. They absorb heat. Heat that is emitted from the Earth's surface is absorbed by these gases to some extent, that heat would otherwise, if not absorbed, have simply traveled through the atmosphere and gone out to space. So having these gases in the atmosphere and increasing their concentrations increases the capability of the atmosphere to absorb and retain heat. And that is what we're seeing occurring. So what is carbon dioxide? Well, it's a gas, uh, a molecule made up of two elements, carbon and oxygen, in the formation CO2, and we're all very familiar with that. Now, I want you just to remember that when we think about human emissions of carbon and fossil fuel combustion in particular, burning of coal, oil, and gas for energy production, what is emitted to the atmosphere directly is not CO2, but carbon. So we, humans, through our activities, are putting carbon, extra carbon, into the atmosphere. And we see this in the CO2 record from places like Mauna Loa in Hawaii in the Pacific and at the South Pole in the blue curve. So an increasing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since the late 1950s at least measured at these two places. But if it's us, if there's a human signature in this, we're not emitting CO2 directly, we're just emitting carbon. So the CO2 that we're measuring must be derived from carbon and oxygen. If an increase in anthropogenic or human carbon is behind at least some of this, then we should see oxygen decreasing in the atmosphere because the carbon must combine with oxygen in order to form the CO2. And what do we see? At Alert Bay in Canada and at Cape Grim in Tasmania and many other places around the world, measurements of atmospheric oxygen show indeed a decline in oxygen. So here is one little piece of scientific evidence for the anthropogenic or human origin of what we're seeing in the CO2 rise. It is carbon from fossil fuel combustion and land clearing in particular that is leading to this modern observed rise in CO2. Now, I would like to show you another animation here to show you what's been going on in more detail. Now, what we're seeing here is places around the world that have been measuring carbon dioxide. They're in this little map over here. The red dot is Mauna Loa in Hawaii, and you can see the red dot on the graph over here as well. And it seems... Oh, it's still running. It's catching up with itself, I think. The blue dot is the South Pole, and we can see the blue dot over here on the graph on the left at 90 degrees south. 
in between, we've got other observation points uh, that have been uh, measuring CO2 in the atmosphere over time. And as the graph goes forward in time, you'll see more and more of those dots appearing across the globe as different uh, organizations have been measuring CO2 and reporting into this process. On the right-hand side, not quite sure why it's stalled. On the right-hand side, uh, we have the graph showing the uh, monthly values of carbon dioxide at Mauna Loa and at the South Pole, and that graph will grow over time. And here we have a time scale in this little box which shows you the year and the month as the graph progresses. But the animation doesn't seem to be working properly, which is a pity. Yeah, I might have to leave it. You can get the idea. What, what one sees is that the um, southern hemisphere, the CO2 levels rise progressively across the graph, but there's not a great deal of fluctuation going on there as that happens. But in the northern hemisphere, there's a very strong annual cycle and you get a sort of waving effect of the, the CO2 levels on the graph. But nevertheless, there's a constant rise of levels of concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is happening right across the globe at all of the observation stations that we're seeing. And by the time you get to the end of this, which is 2010, and this animation runs to 2010, what one sees is that the graph is actually off the top of this scale. So while we started in the 1980s at concentrations of CO2 of about 335, 336 parts per million in the atmosphere, by the time we get to 2010, we're up above 390. And this year, we're set to exceed 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And this will again be a new record, and one of which I don't think we should be particularly proud. Um, the highest concentration of CO2 is reached in May, and we fully expect that by May this year, we will have reached uh, just in excess of 400 parts per million of CO2. The more CO2 and other greenhouse gases there are in the atmosphere, the stronger the tendency towards warming, because these gases are absorbing heat from the, um, from the surface. OK, I'm going to stop this, because unfortunately, it's not going to play for us. What it also demonstrates uh, is uh, going backwards in time, we can go back uh, about 800,000 years from ice core records in Antarctica, and that allows us to look at how unusual the current situation is. So I will simply tell you um, that the, let's get this back to full screen, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere in the geological record from the ice cores in Antarctica shows us that the minimum level that is achieved naturally is 180 parts per million of CO2, and the maximum that occurs due to natural forcings, such as the orbital variations, is 280 parts per million. So we've got a range there through just the natural workings of the system between 180 and 280 parts per million, and we are now heading for 400. And there is nothing in the natural system that uh, shows us levels like that in any, anything during the last million years, yes. It's, it's due to that, uh, what I was just talking about uh, earlier about the vegetation. The southern hemisphere is largely oceanic. So the, the ocean buffers all these effects. The ocean takes up and gives off CO2 as well. Uh, but not at, in the, at the same rapidity and with the same sort of extremes, if you like, within a 12-month period as you find uh, with the vegetation. But so... Yes, that's correct. And that signature is what makes the northern hemisphere signal more variable than the southern hemisphere signal. It, the, the, it is latitudinal because the, the vegetation, the vegetation uh, mass is in the northern hemisphere. So you see, when you're measuring the northern hemisphere, you see a bigger signal of variation across the northern hemisphere than you do in the southern hemisphere. Yes. Yes, it could be. You'd get a reasonable proxy for that. Wasn't a factor? Well, it's just Sure.
There, there is less data in the Southern Hemisphere, that's true, but in this early period. There's much more data in the Southern Hemisphere as we go forward in time. So unfortunately, I can't show you the rest of the animation. I'm quite happy to make it available to you. And in fact, it's available online as well. There's, there's a, a version of this that's a much smaller file that is available online, and I can direct you to the website if you'd like to have a look at it. And you can see, see that the, what I'm showing here applies through time even with more data in the Southern Hemisphere more recently. Okay? So, I shall move on. Um, what I would uh, now like to do so in the last few minutes is just talk a little bit about responses. What I've tried to highlight is that we have clear and incontrovertible evidence that warming is occurring and that the rate of warming is extremely rapid and unprecedented. Uh, we also have strong evidence that there is an anthropogenic or human signal that is contributing to the warming that we are currently experiencing, to the increase in temperatures and the increase in CO2, that these are not simply natural phenomena at this point in time. Uh, and that then leads us to the uh, realization that we do need to respond to this thing. It is not simply going to be addressed by natural processes. So responses are imperative. And even if it was simply natural processes, we still have to respond because we're living in an environment that is changing around us and we therefore have to adapt. The argument about uh, response and agency, I think, comes down more uh, perhaps when you think about mitigation of the causes of climate change. So what are the challenges that we're facing? Uh, this slide shows uh, some work that was published by CSIRO at the end, towards the end of 2011. It's a publication called Climate Change, Science and Solutions for Australia. I think it's a really excellent report. It's available freely on their website as a PDF. You can download it. It's an excellent book. And what they were looking at was how challenging is it going to be, in this case for Australia, to deal with different levels of temperature rise, different warming relative to the late 20th century temperatures? So when we look at this, we've got temperature change up the left-hand axis, uh, and then we're looking at different sectors uh, of socioeconomic activity and the environment. So water security, coastal communities, energy security, major infrastructure such as roads, airports, etc. cetera, uh, heat-related deaths and health impacts, tourism, agriculture, food security, natural ecosystems, and sustainable development. The color coding shows the uh, what's called the coping range in green. Now, the coping range simply is an evaluation of how natural systems and our management strategies are able to deal with the impact of various temperature changes on these different sectors. So we've got a coping range between zero and about half a degree in terms of water security in which we wouldn't expect to be particularly challenged at all. What we have currently can cope. We then have adaptive capacity up to somewhere around the two degrees of warming. In other words, if we make some changes, we can deal with it, we can adapt. But then we get into what is called the vulnerability range when we get into the red. Now you'll notice that there aren't any clear lines defining the boundaries between these, and that's because of course we don't know exactly what, at what temperature we are vulnerable in any of these, but we do know roughly how much we think we can cope with in terms of these particular sectors. So, uh, zero is relative to the late 20th century. It's relative to 1990. So we're talking about warming. We're somewhere up there. We're already some way up there, yes, we are. And we, and we know that. We see that. Yeah. We're having problems with water security already in parts of Australia. We're having problems with agricultural productivity and food, food supply when we've got severe droughts occurring, those kinds of things. So we are heading at the moment for two degrees, and there is no doubt in the scientific community that we are going to reach two degrees and it probably exceed, in fact, almost definitely exceed the two degrees of global warming. So for Australia, that means that we will be getting very close to real vulnerability in terms of water, coastal communities, largely because of sea level rise, and natural ecosystems will be well and truly into vulnerability. There are many that are already vulnerable at the less than one degree that we've currently experienced. In some other sectors, it's considered that we'll be getting into adaptive capacity and not into vulnerability yet at two degrees. 
if we continue along the trajectory of emissions that we globally have at the moment, we will not stop at two degrees. We will be heading much more likely towards the four degrees or beyond as we get towards the end of the century. We will reach two degrees this century, around the middle of the century, and we will then be going beyond that. And of course, these uh, assessments of adaptive capacity and vulnerability are based on current understanding, and they don't take into account the challenges that we would face should there be a step change, a sudden, abrupt change in any part of the operation of the system as a result of climate change. And those tipping point threshold events are ones that the scientific community is very concerned about and is spending a considerable amount of uh, scientific time and attention on. So, lots of challenges in terms of adaptation, and we have to adapt because these changes are with us and they will continue into the future. If we want to attempt as best we can to minimise the adaptation challenge and to minimise what we're facing into the further future, then we have to think about mitigation. Now, the sources of greenhouse gases that would need to be mitigated includes, include those associated with energy generation predominantly, transport, energy for buildings, uh, industry and power generation directly, but also include non-energy related emissions from waste, agriculture and land use. What to do about these? Can we moderate these emissions? Can we reduce them? Well, of course we can. And we can do this through careful management and the judicious applications of technology. And I would say that the primary reason that I still hold out some hope uh, for us, for human societies, uh, as we go into the future, is that we actually do have the solutions to hand, at least some of them, and that we are in a position right now to implement them. We're simply being rather slow to go about that implementation. So if we simply think about power generation and energy use and what we could do to reduce the carbon emissions that are associated with that, that puts us in a space where we are actually able to do something about uh, the fossil fuel related emissions that are going into the atmosphere. Would you mind if I took your question in just a minute and I'll carry on to the next slide first. So in terms of future emissions, uh, what, are, what are we dealing with and what can we do about it? Well, this graph shows fossil fuel related emissions specifically through time. The black line is what we've already emitted. And in fact, this needs a little bit of updating. This comes from the Global Carbon Project. And then we have various scenarios for future emissions based around the Intergovernmental Cl Panel on Climate Change scenarios. If we want to stabilize global warming at two degrees above late 20th century values, then we are looking at following that green line through time. We need to get down to where that green line is that's uh, stabilizing at 450 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere by the end of the century. At the moment, we're traveling slightly to the left of the red line. So we're heading off up here. The longer we delay, the more we go into the future following that trajectory, the further we go from the desirable green trajectory, the stabilization at 450 parts per million. We're creating a bigger and bigger gap, emissions gap, if you like, that has to be addressed. And this is one of the reasons why when economic analysis is done of the climate change challenge by people like Ross Garneau or Nicholas Stern, they're saying that action now will cost us a lot less than action further into the future. Yes, there's a cost, but that cost is much reduced uh, if we take early action rather than late action. And what strategies are available to us? Well, a lot of the emissions that are currently behind the rising levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are related with power generation and power use. So anything that deals with energy efficiency and savings and with alternative energy sources that are non-carbon intensive in the long term is a win in terms of decarbonizing uh, our energy. Now, it's not impossible. We have the technologies we know we have. We have solar, we have wind, we have bio, we have uh, hydro, we have wave and tidal power. There are many sources available to us that we can use right now and that we can implement. We're simply not moving along that path 
of uh, alternative energy fast enough to counteract uh, the growing emissions from fossil fuels, which continue to the present. There are other aspects to this, of course, which one should not um, ignore, and those include better land management for carbon and other greenhouse gas sequestration. So managing forest is one of those, but agriculture plays a role here as well. And there's, of course, population. The more people the more energy demand, the more need for development, the more consumption, and so that also leads to uh, issues with emissions. That's a difficult one to address, however, of course. The scenarios that the IPCC has put together, and for example, this tailing off later in the 21st century of the high emission scenario is due to population, global population stabilization and assumption that population will stabilize and will start to come down, and that uh, further use of renewables will start to kick in even uh, along that scenario because we simply start to run out of some of the fossil fuels, so at least the easily accessible ones. So there are many strategies available to us. We simply need to develop ways of dealing with the perhaps politically unpalatable implementation strategies for this as rapidly as possible so that we don't progress any further than we have to along that red curve that we see in the graph. Uh, if you are interested in following up further and would like to uh, have a, a few other sources to have a look at, here are just a few of many that are available. I find these to be particularly accessible in terms of being written at an appropriate level um, and for non-scientists, but being scientifically accurate. A short introduction to climate change by Tony Eggleton was published late last year. Uh, he's an ANU scientist, um, in fact, a geologist and earth scientist. The Hot Topic, How to Tackle Global Warming and Still Keep the Lights On, uh, is a UK publication, and Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air uh, has a, a real look at sustainable energy and the viability of implementation. I hope that what I've been able to share with you today uh, gives you a bit of insight into some of the science behind climate change and some of our very current understanding of the issues around that science, uh, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have.